Well, welcome and thank you for joining us on this International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, uh, which takes place annually on March 21st. We are delighted to have with us today Dr. Rita Sherma of the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California, to address these critically important issues. Dr. Sherma is founding director and associate Pre professor of the Shingal Center for Dharma Studies at the GTU, where she also serves as a member of the core doctoral faculty, department chair of the Theology and Ethics Department, and co-chair of the Sustainability 360 Initiative. Dr. Sherma's talk today is titled, Healing and Hope in a Time of COVID-19, Climate Calamity, and Broken Communities. And for those who are interested, it has now been published in the Journal of the Society for Hindu Christian Studies. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Sharma, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Matt, for that introduction. And good morning to everyone. Uh, I want to first start by reminding all of us that the Graduate Theological Union is situated in Berkeley, California, on the territory of the Huichen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Olone people, the successors of the Verona Band of Alameda County. This terrain continues to hold deep significance for the Muwekma Olone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We acknowledge that it is crucially important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we sit, but also that we appreciate the needs and interests of the Muwek Maolone people who are integral members of the contemporary Berkeley and Bay Area communities. And they must be accorded, these needs must be accorded our interest and concerns as first peoples of our region and our present neighbors on whose land we are located. It seems fitting to start this with a land acknowledgement as today, March 21st, is the International Day for the Elimination of racial discrimination. The International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination is observed annually. It is observed on March 21st because on that day in 1960, police opened fire and killed 60 people at a nonviolent demonstration in Sharpeville, South Africa. And they were there demonstrating against apartheid laws. The United Nations proclaimed this day in 1966 to encourage the eradication of racial discrimination worldwide. Thank you for being with us. Here in the United States, we are struggling to attain such an eradication. Mar on March 16th, just a few days ago, nine people were victims in shootings at three different spas in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Of the eight people who lost their lives, six were women of Asian origin. On March 19th, in an address in Atlanta, President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris called for unity and for an end to violence targeting Asian Americans. Correspondent named Amara Walker, who is Asian American, encapsulated what AAPI, that is Asian American Pacific Islander communities, experience on it as a daily reality, even when they're not being violently attacked. She said that the gift that President Biden and Vice President Harris offered was not tangible, but it was healing. She said Asian Americans, because of their outreach, felt seen and heard almost for the first time. And 
Americans of every Asian heritage, including mine, experience the long, long standing hermeneutics of cultural suspicion. That is, they are perceived to be not American, even if their families have called America home for many generations. Forever foreigners, forever banished from a sense of belonging, the invisible indignities of being Asian American are widespread and unacknowledged. Law enforcement officials often refuse to recognize patterns of violence against these communities. Yet, whether violent or simply vile, acts of malevolence against AAPI communities are real and present dangers to the health and well being of these persons and harmful to the integrity of the fabric of our nation. This has been an eventful year. The past 12 months saw an outbreak of a global pandemic, climate crisis, and national social unrest, unlike anything we've known in generations. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd died while undergoing arrest as Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin kneeled on his neck for nearly 10 minutes. Protests erupted in countless cities worldwide and in many a state and territory of the United States, as well as in Washington, DC. The BLM and allied protests continued for months. Internationally, protests began in solidarity with those in the United States who were demanding a, a stop to police violence against unarmed African-American men and women. But soon they began to evolve into marches for justice in relation to particular issues of freedom from oppression faced by diverse groups in this nation and across the globe. The US protests asked for justice in the case of law enforcement interaction and use of force in encounters with black and brown bodies, demilitarization of municipal police forces and restorative justice. It reminded America and the world of the history not only of slavery, but of the indentured labor and the economic political disenfranchisement that was Jim Crow. In many ways, it continued long after the period known as Jim Crow. It brought an awareness to a, almost a century of lynching of black men and women, the horrific ex legacy of extrajudicial killings it taught a stunned populace about the economic and social success of Greenwood, a historic freedom colony in Tulsa, Oklahoma, known as Black Wall Street, which was completely destroyed in the Tulsa massacre of 1921. In the wake of the 2020 protests, black intellectuals such as ta Coates and Dr. Abraham Kendi and others have called for restorative justice. As protests grew wider, Native peoples joined the demonstrations with Black Lives Matter protesters and separately. While the nation was still paying attention, awareness grew about the historic and contemporary mass suffering and ethnic cleansing of indigenous nations across vast unceded territories of the Americas. And the plight of captured undocumented children and adults terrified the imagination of the nation. As protests continued, violence broke out between supremacist groups and protesters, between police and rioters, between groups of justice seekers and domestic groups of justice deniers. Unnamed 
federal law enforcement officials in unmarked vehicles and those seeking to exercise their right of dissent. These divisions culminated in an insurrectionist attack on the capital, the citadel of American democracy. If all of the above occurred in any other country over a period of less than a year, the world would watch in sadness and anger, and perhaps some nations would try to send aid or attempt diplomatic intervention. But this took place in the United States of America, and the world experienced whiplash as it turned to watch in shock and horror. When a great power becomes unstable, all that depends on it becomes unbalanced and unsecured. Dependent then seems like a danger in a doomsday scenario. However, beyond the critical need for justice highlighted by the events of 2020, that year has also brought us the worst global pandemic in a century. The pandemic became a skewed curve of suffering and increased mortality in black and brown communities and offered economic devastation in its wake to all communities. In addition, the immediacy of the climate calamity that we are now facing became undeniable over the past year. Thus far, we have witnessed the first double hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, unprecedented wildfires that rendered large swaths of the west coast of the United States as charred wreckage, super cyclone Ampham in Bengal and Bangladesh, and calamitous blizzards in Texas, yes, Texas. We need to look at challenges beyond the symptomatic or even systemic. We need to examine the relationship between social oppression, climate and environmental injustice, ecological disaster, and catastrophic climate change. All of these form a network of interconnected subjugations that cannot be resolved without a complete reversal of our extremely poor relationships with each other and with the ecosystems of the biosphere of which we are only one part. Increasingly, contemporary scholars of religious studies, philosophers of religion, and theologians have articulated the ways in which religious thought and practice can reconceptualize our relationship with each other and with the Earth's life support systems. In the meantime, religious groups across the globe have begun to work to develop forward-leaning initiatives that support the well-being of communities. As religions become increasingly engaged with the problems of a degraded earth, the academic study of religion has not only to keep pace with these issues, but critically assess the impact of religion on best practices or lack thereof during our current pandemic and the related issues we are facing. As scholars of religious or spiritual traditions, which are also wellsprings of deep resources for ethics and reflection, it behooves us to go deeper and explore how these resources may be applied towards the amelioration of the network of trauma that now reigns supreme. In all of the crises that are now facing the planetary community, the relational malfeasance of humans between communities and between human civilization and the biosphere is visible in the interconnected oppressions that intersect in chains that choke the subjugated and evident in the invasion 
of wilderness. This relational malfeasance is visible in all of our various ways in which we deal with the problem of racial discrimination and the human cost of our malfeasance in terms of the ecosphere itself of vast devastation and pollution is also massive in terms of its implications for racial equity and non-discrimination because we have seen through study after study that it leads not only to economic and social inequities, but to environmental discrimination. Malfeasance in this form of wrong relationship to the ecosphere involves a certain attitude of mind, one that rationalizes causing injury to the non-human other as defensible in the interest of a radically disconnected, unrelated, independent selfhood. Mutual causality is not perceived. Reciprocal conditioning is not acknowledged and interdependence is denied. This ease and facility with causing harm to non-human others spreads easily then to dehumanize persons, groups, races, and communities. Comfort with causing harm spreads and infects an individual's entire perspective and causes moral injury to the perpetrator in variegated ways. Whether that perpetrator is an individual, a community, or a nation, that moral injury adheres to them. Justice seekers in the United States and throughout the world have not only focused attention on social and economic injustice, they have questioned more recently in the last year, especially, they have questioned everything we have settled for as normatives, the worldviews, the religious perspectives, the rituals and embodied practices of socially disadvantaged or culturally disenfranchised peoples, which have historically been viewed as sites of inferiority and of alienated otherness by power hegemonies, are now instead being foregrounded as sources of valid, important, epistemic experience. And this is an ongoing challenge, and it is a challenge that is absolutely intrinsic to the fight for racial parity and the end of racial discrimination. The denial of the validity of the embodied epistemologies of non-hegemonic persons, cultures, and species is the denial of sentient experience. It is indeed the denial of life itself. Such denial leads easily and dangerously to the diminution of the right to life and liberty of sentient beings, human and other than human. Finally, in the struggle to make the world whole again, or whole for the first time in terms of our relationship to it, we cannot underestimate the power of contemplative activism, either for the public scholar or for advocates working against incalculable and heart-wrenching challenges. In, here again, in contemplative activism, the traditions that we study as scholars of religion have a plethora of contemplative practices and principles to repair a broken spirit, to restore hope. It is time for a deeper study beyond critique alone. It is time to illuminate the resources within the tradition that can and do bring healing and wholeness 
into these troubled times and minds. One of the most important resources from the traditions that I study is the concept of ahimsa. Ahimsa is a central value in Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism, uh, known as the Dharma traditions uh, that emerged in ancient India and are now global in scope and presence. Ahimsa is often translated as nonviolence or non-harming. The depth and purpose of Ahimsa when such a translation as nonviolence is used is diminished. Instead of viewing Ahimsa as part of the binary of violence and nonviolence, or even harming and non-harming, it is much more skillful to perceive ahimsa in relationship to himsa as love versus the absence of love. The sage Patanjali, uh, circa 100 CE, the author of the famous Yoga Sutra, regards ahimsa as the yogi's greatest vow, Mahavrata, greatest vow. In his commentary on the Yoga Sutras, the scholar Vyasa defines ahimsa as the absence of injuriousness towards all living beings in all respects and for all times. Let me repeat that. The absence of injuriousness towards all living beings in all respects and for all times. Ahimsa is one of the cardinal values of Jainism where it is the first of the five great vows. Pancha Mahabrata. And Gandhi's entire platform and policy and philosophy of resistance to power is based on ahimsa. Perhaps no religion in the world has explained the principle of ahimsa so deeply and systematically as Jainism. It is, but it is also one of the, the, first, the very first of the five precepts of Buddhism. And in the Hindu world, it has been extensively commented upon. The fifth century Tamil scholar Vallubhar, in his famous work, Tirukkural, rigorously taught about the spiritual importance of ahimsa and moral vegetarianism. The Hindu monk and physician, Swami Shivananda Saraswati, 1887 to 1963, championed selfless service as spiritual praxis. And he wrote about this as Ahimsa extensively. And he wrote about the implications of Ahimsa for moral, ethical, and spiritual dimensions of human life. He explained the principle of Ahimsa as not only merely negative, as non-injury, it is positive for him as love for the world. It is a development, according to him, of a mental attitude in which malice and malevolence is replaced by love. Ahimsa is true sacrifice. Ahimsa is forgiveness. Ahimsa is shakti or divine power. Ahimsa is true strength. Ahimsa is not an idea but a proactive praxis of spiritual formation. The practice of ahimsa develops love. These are the thoughts of Swami Shivananda Saraswati. And Swami Shivananda described ahimsa as another name for truth as well as love. But he said that ahimsa fundamentally is universal love. It is pure love. It is divine prema. Where there is this divine love, prema, there we find ahimsa. And where there is ahimsa, we will find love and selfless service. 
So ahimsa is not just nonviolence. It is loving service as spiritual praxis. The reverse of such interrelationship is himsa. <laughs> there are subtle forms of himsa, what we today call microaggressions. And Swami Srivananda and others have noted, particularly that it is unreflective to think that the living practice of ahimsa requires simply that we do not hurt any living being physically. That is but gross form of ahimsa. The vow of ahimsa is broken even by experiencing contempt for another human or non-human being, by harboring prejudice towards anyone, by discrimination in the mind towards another, by abusing others by word or act, by speaking ill of others, by libeling or vilifying others, by thoughts of hatred, by uttering lies, by ruining another in any way whatsoever. Violence arises in the mind. Therefore, it is the mind that has to be changed in order for violence to cease. It starts with a thought and it becomes a word. The word becomes action. Action becomes habits. These habits form our character and cause us moral injury and cause others great harm. Therefore, harsh, rude speech is himsa, violence and injury to others. Using harsh words to the homeless to those who provide us service or those who work for us is himsa. Wounding the feelings of others by gesture, posture, uh, expression, the, the tone of one's voice, caricature, satire, and unkind, cruel words is also himsa. Slighting another in front of others or even privately or showing deliberate discourtesy to a person is wanton wanton himsa. But we are not to be content by abjuring such attitudes and behaviors in our own thoughts and actions. To approve of another's harsh actions is indirect himsa. To fail to relieve another's pain or even to neglect to go to the person in distress is a form of himsa. It is the sin not only of commission, but it is also the sin of omission. Thus, all forms of harshness, direct and indirect, positive, negative, immediate or delayed, is himsa. Dharma teachers across cultures and continents have agreed on this, that ahimsa, or supreme love, prema, is the highest practice. And yes, it is not an abstention. It is an active praxis. Ahimsa is agape love. It is the foundation on which all relationships flourish, including that of communities and nations. This is how we become one people out of many races, one nation out of many narratives, and one people out of many pluralities. The foundational principle of a pluribus unum, out of many, one, is stamped on one side of the great seal of the United States, along with the motto, Novus Ordo Secularum, New Order of the Ages, on the other side. The dynamic determination of the American dream is to create one people out of many origins, one story out of many narratives. This vision of creating a nation unlike any other led us to a new order forged in freedom. This dream and this drive are emblazoned on the great seal 
and etched on the hearts and minds of trailblazing Americans of every color and race and creed. Another 18th century visionary document, the U.S. Bill of Rights, states in Article 7 that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Yet over the recent past, echoing the worst moments of our complex history, which includes slavery and genocide, innocence so recently have been shot down in cold blood by those who believe that American residency is the privilege of just one ethnicity, one religion, one race. In such incidents, a few violent minds, sometimes many violent minds, but not a plurality, have sought to overthrow the wisdom of our founding documents. Such efforts are motivated not by fidelity to our foundational principles, but by conformity with the purveyors of intolerance and discrimination. They have failed in the past and they will fail again. They have attempted to snuff out the will of a people to live, to survive, to flourish, and then if they have failed to do so. It will enhance the legacy of our generation and our nation. If all violence and discrimination based on race is unequivocally condemned by leaders across the many sectors of our society, by education, by industry, by our lawmakers, and by all of us individuals who hold any kind of podium. These reflections take me back to the Upanishads, the canonical sacred text of my four millennia old ancestral spiritual heritage with its vast history before this century of peaceful coexistence and its resolve to forge one out of many. Om Sahana Vatu Sahana Bhunatu Sahaviryam Karva Vahai Tijasvinavadita Mastu Mavid Visavahai Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om, may we be protected together. May we be nourished together. May we work together with great dynamism. May our intellectual effort be vigorous and effective. May we experience no conflict with each other. Om, may there be peace in all three dimensions of life. Thank you.